All right, welcome back. As you can see, I've refilled my coffee, and uh, trust me, it's just coffee. And <clears throat> we are ready to proceed on to section one called Principles of Title Insurance, including the underwriting process and escrow issues, all right? So in this section, we're gonna break it down into six different little topics for you. We're gonna talk about title insurance and how it works, exactly what it is. We're gonna talk about reasons why people buy title insurance. And then we're also gonna talk about the problems. They call these the defects in the title insurance. We're gonna talk about a lien that gets placed on your property and how they actually can affect the title and the ownership. We'll talk about the underwriter and their process of what they do and how they do it. And then we're gonna look a little bit at that magic word called escrow uh, because it's used several different ways depending on what person you're talking to. So that's what we're gonna be covering in this section right here, all right? So let's get started and talk a little bit about title insurance and how it works. So basically, title insurance is nothing more than an insurance policy. It's not like any other insurance that you would buy. It's just like car insurance, homeowner's insurance, health insurance. It protects people. In this particular situation, it protects the lender and the owner to legal claims or legal fees that can arise out of the dispute of the ownership. Who actually owns the property? Now, you may think you own the property, and a lot of times everybody does. However, there may be some issues where somebody else may think they have a claim against your property. So the title insurance policy is broken into two parts. There is the owner's policy, which protects the current owner or the seller in this deal uh, with ownership issues. Then they have this other part of the policy called the lender's policy, which technically protects the mortgage company, but to some extent it protects the buyers as well. I have seen several cases of properties close with cash where there was no lender per se and the lender's policy was not purchased. Now that doesn't mean to say that a person buying cash can't get a lender's policy and claim themselves as the lender so that their investment is protected. I've always thought that was smart but you may see some deals where there's no lender's policy due to the fact that there technically is no lender or mortgage placed upon the property, all right? Now, but what happens if someone else comes forward claiming ownership? You know, there are many other people that could try and claim the ownership. Well, that's why we have this lender's title insurance policy and the owner's policy to protect these claims or ensure these claims. And if in fact, the title that was passed was wrong and there are other rightful owners, that title insurance policy could pay the value to the homeowner or to the lender in the amount that was owed if it in fact was a legal claim, much like car insurance. You have an accident, you get your car insurance and they will pay for that claim. It's very similar in that aspect. Now, despite all of the people that are in this series of events, um, there is still a title of search and a title examination and things can pop up. It could pop up at closing. It could pop up right before closing. I have seen things pop up after closing, all right? So everybody's human and there are, thank goodness, probably three or four different people that are going to review this to hope they find any potential problem. 
things like a forged signature on a deed. That could possibly mean that, hey, the property you own wasn't transferred to that person or uh, an unknown heir. I'm telling you now, that's about 80% of all the claims I've ever seen is when an heir pops up to the property. You know, grandma died, passed the property to her daughter, and all of a sudden uh, an aunt goes, wait a minute, I own part of that. You know, part of my mom's uh, legacy was to me. There could be issues with powers of attorney. Uh, you'll see powers of attorney where they'll sign for someone else. Well, it's possible that POA is expired or out and out right fabricated, which is a real fancy, nice word for forged. Um, you know, we've seen Family members try and do that for their parents that are, you know, old and, and infirmed and they'll sign and they'll say, well, I don't really have power of attorney, but mom would want to do this. Well, that may not be true. So there's an issue here. And then unfortunately, sometimes there's just a flat out mistake in some public records. Remember, the recorder's office are human as well and they can occasionally make a mistake. So there are all kinds of problems or reasons that could arise out of this. Um, title insurance is a financial protection against these and other hazards that we didn't really talk about. So the insurance policy that you're buying, just like your car insurance, health insurance, is a financial protection. It's funny thing is title insurance, like every other insurance in the world, I'm sure you guys, I don't want to pay for insurance. And then the second you have an accident, you're like, well, I'm sure glad I had insurance on my car. But yes, same thing here. 99% of the time, there's no issue. And you walk away from closing and you go, oh, I paid that money for an insurance policy and nothing happened. Well, the one time that you need it, you're sure going to be glad you had it. Uh, the title insurer will pay for defending against an attack. They call it an, an attack. Um, it's not physically harmful. I mean, it's just someone else standing up and going, hey, I have a claim on the property. And they will either defend against that claim or fix it, or they could actually pay out just like insurance. And all of this is just a one-time closing fee at the closing all right let's go over here and look at something so that we can maybe talk about it <clears throat> we've got title insurance here and i'm going to write regular insurance here and what i mean by that is probably most of the insurance you guys understand car insurance uh, health insurance life insurance anything like that Title insurance only covers things that have already happened. Hey, someone else is making a claim. I write better than this, but in this position, it's kind of hard. Because it's only protecting things that have already happened, like, hey, someone's put a lien on the property or someone else is making a claim to the property. It is a historical in nature where regular insurance usually is paid for future stuff. Like, I may have a car wreck tomorrow. I may get sick tomorrow. So there is a significant difference. And because title insurance only covers historical stuff that's already happened, you can't change history. There are a lot of classes in high school right now that are trying to do that. But dude, it's already happened. And because of that, the premium is only paid one time. All right. Whereas in regular insurance, the premium is paid as long as you need it. Hey, I didn't use it this month. I've got to pay for it next month. And then I got to pay for it the following month. So title insurance is only paid one time and it's paid at the closing. All right. A um, couple other things here. 
after all, the home is the most important investment for most people. So why would you not want some insurance to protect you? And if you have questions, feel free to, you know, call uh, the, your owner, the, the boss of the company or your owner or, or a closer and talk to them about it. If a person bought owner's insurance, the insurance company can resolve the problem. They will actually intercede and try and figure out what's going on, or they can reimburse the owner for the losses they occur. If there was a lender's title policy bought, the insurance company will once again try and resolve the problem, i.e. fix it, or they could reimburse the lender for the amount of the loan, all right? It could even cover the lawsuit if there's one involved in defending the ownership rights of the buyer or the seller. So that's what the insurance policy is there for. It is there to protect buyers and sellers. And if their situation arises, they will either fix the problem or they'll pay the claim. Okay. Now, when a policy is purchased, it is purchased for a specific value. That value is called the face value. There are maximum limits uh, don't apply to this. What I mean by that is if there is a claim, it will only pay up to the face value. If you have a $100,000 title insurance policy, it will only pay up to $100,000. you are not going to profit per se, in an insurance claim. But there's no maximum on the policy amount, meaning you buy a $2 million house, you can get a $2 million insurance policy. So the payouts are limited, but the face value is not limited, um, if that's clear, all right? Let's go back to here. So title insurance only has a face value. where this, in theory, could have an unlimited payout. You know, you buy health insurance and you catch some rare disease, they're going to pay. Whereas on title, you buy a $100,000 policy, the most they're going to pay out is the $100,000 face value. So there are limitations on the payout, but not limitations on the policy you get. And obviously you can't get a million dollar policy if the house price is 300,000. You would get a $300,000 policy. There are also some exclusions in the policy, just like there might be exclusions in your health insurance, all right? Sometimes they call those pre-existing conditions in your policy. In your title policy, there are going to be some exclusions that are not covered. So make sure that you talk to a closing agent to get a full list of anything that may not be covered. Now, when they write the policy and they print it out and they give a copy to you know everybody in the deal, there is a Schedule B that states all of their exclusions, all right? In the end, the title insurance is the best protection of the ownership rights. Sometimes you may think it's very significant. Uh, your clients may think it's very significant. But remember, it's only assessed one time, but it covers forever. It will cover your heirs and it will also cover people that you sell it to down the road. So don't get too don't let your clients get too upset with you when, when you start quoting premiums because it is an insurance policy and it is probably the best thing they're ever going to get, especially if something happens. Now, <clears throat> let me drink some coffee here. There are things that they call title defects. Title defects or title issues are not very common. All right, 99% of all the deals you'll ever close, there's probably not going to be an issue. Um, but if there is an issue, typically they're not a small issue. That's the one thing that I continually laugh about in this uh, process is 
it's either nothing or way difficult okay very seldom is there a small issue you know because they'll solve that really quick it collect quickly a defect is a condition that calls into question who the legal owner of the property is although title searches are done before all the homes are purchased there could be some problems that are not obvious and therefore can be unknown for several years and potentially across several title transfers i have seen this one time in my career where there was a claim made on ownership about three sales after it happened one of the family members came back and said hey when my brother sold this house in 1980 i was part owner on that and was not contacted yada 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 and the house had transferred two times since then so there was a huge problem that had to go back and get resolved so that they could in essence make that title clear here are some common defects that you might see in a title work now these are not the only ones these are just some that would pop up you could have missing signatures people don't sign and typically when that is uh, a missing signature it's probably because it's one of the owners or one of the people claiming to be an owner unknown errors or unknown liens um, we had a deal several years ago where a, pro a guy sold a property after they sold it american express came back and said hey we had a lien on that previous guy that didn't get settled because it was an unrecorded lien an unrecorded release um, that's not really a huge problem a release is where when you get a mortgage let's say you get a mortgage in 1990 and you pay your 30 years so in the year 2020 it got paid off well what happens when you pay the bank off they send you a release of the lien if you fail to record that when they look in the title records they do not see they see the mortgage that was attached in 1990 but they don't see this yet because this hasn't been recorded so sometimes owners are like oh well i paid that off well it still shows oh yeah you know the bank sent me a document uh is this important yeah dude that's the release so that your house is showing free and clear so you, you can get those occasionally sometimes they just don't do the recording right there's a human mistake they record one before they record the other or they fail to record one undocumented encumbrances this happens occasionally hey two properties are sharing a driveway and they never recorded the fact that house number two gets to use house number one's driveway so the new owner now of house number one goes why are you driving on the driveway well dude i i i, I was given the right to drive on that driveway because we share it well it's not in the records so we've seen that happen undisclosed errors forgery forgery is such a really bad word here because that makes it sound like there's some nefarious activities going on and i am sure in certain cases there are um, maybe more than i really want to recognize because i'd like to think that most people do everything legally um, a lot of times what you see is exactly what i mentioned earlier uh, one of the child signs their mom's name because oh they're sick and they're in a nursing home but they don't have the legal right to do that through a power of attorney that could be considered forgery mental incompetence we had a deal literally just february of this year seller signed up or the seller showed up to close and he was drunk uh, he was celebrating early, you know, he's like, hey, I'm selling my house, we have a drink. And the title company literally said, we're not closing today. You're not in your right state of mind. And we certainly don't want you waking up tomorrow sober 
challenging, hey, what did I sign? I didn't mean to sign that. So mental incompetence. There was a court case here in the state of Indiana. Father uh, gave the new wife all the money of his estate. The kids claimed the father was on painkillers and that his decision was wrong. So they challenged uh, his will. Now that really, it had, there was some real property in that case, but I meant that's just an example of the mental incompetence. Name confusion. You know, I knew a guy that signed his name, Roger P. Smith. Smith wasn't his real last name. I'm just changing that. And then he signed it R. Paul Smith. Still his legal name, but very confusing. You might see this sometimes with married females uh, buy property in one name when they're single and then want to sell it when they're married or vice versa. They're married and now they're single. Um, there could be other things like I've signed my name before Raymond Modulin and I've signed it Raymond D. Modulin. So there could be some name confusion and there's a whole bunch of other potential defects and I can't tell you all of them because things pop up all the time that you go, what the heck was that? I've never seen that before. And I've been doing this 20 years, all right? So let's talk about a lien, all right? So you've heard people say before, hey, one more payment and this baby's mine. That is not true, all right? A lien is a future interest in ownership. It is not actual ownership. When you buy the house, you own the house. Now, you may owe fifth, third money, and you have to pay them back, but they don't own the house. I've heard people say all the time, well, I don't own the bank owns it. No, the bank doesn't own the house. You own the house, all right? They just have a lien against it, and the lien is placed upon it by a party that loans you money. Let's talk about the main one first called a mortgage. Loans you money to buy the property. When you sign the IOU and the mortgage, you are in fact giving that person permission to place a lien on your property. So what happens if you borrow money from fifth third for a hundred grand and it gets recorded on a date. Let's put that date. So now since it came in, it is the earliest one in, it gets what's called first priority. So now when you go to sell the house, and let's say you sell it for 150, the first 100 pays off that lien and you keep the 50 and the new buyer gets to put his new one on. All right, that's one way it happens. Now, you've still got this $150,000 house. Let's say I wanna get a second lien from that city for $50,000. You got that on January 1st of 2011. Notice here the date. It came in after the first one. So this is called a second lien. Sometimes you hear it called a junior lien or subordinate lien because it came in after this was in 2011, this one was in 2001. Now you go to sell your house for 150. The first 100 pays that off. The second 50 pays that off and you walk away with zero money. That is literally how liens work. But this lien in essence is not ownership. It's a future interest in ownership, all right? So how does the lien affect the title? Well, that's very simple and hopefully easily understood that the effect of the lien 
actually reduces your ability to get rid of the property. For example, back on, let's go back to this one over here. Let's get rid of this second lien. Now, your right of disposition allows you to sell the property. It also allows you to give it away. It's your property. You can do with it what you want. However, you have this issue that you owe somebody $100,000. So can I give this property away? The answer would be no, you cannot. Now, you could bring $100,000 to the table and that situation is true in any of these next scenarios. But we're not going to take that into consideration because that does not help me illustrate the point. So I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, you could give it away, but you're going to have to bring 100000 to pay them off. So what this lien does, in essence, it reduces your ability because now you can't give it away. Can you sell it for 50000 Technically, no. Could you sell it for 90000 No. Could you sell it for 100000 Yes. So now you've reduced your ability to give it away because of this lien. You can't, you've got to give it away or sell it, and you need at least a hundred grand to clear off that mortgage. So we can even play the game one further. Let's go back to the Nat City one. Comes in January the 1st, and I think I put 2011. Now look at what happens. Now I can't sell the property for a hundred. I have to sell it for at least 150. So once again, this second lien has reduced my ability to get rid of the property. And we can play this one even further than that just to show you the problematic that could happen. Let's say I get a third lien from a court case and I'm just gonna write court right now. We're not going to get in it. And it's $10,000. That got put on May of 1st of 2020. Now, remember, this house is only worth 150 Now look at how I can get rid of this. Because I actually owe in liens how much? $160,000. So in essence, this lien right here has completely blocked me from selling the property at all. Once again, yes, I could bring 10 grand to the table, but we're not counting this because I need to illustrate the point of how liens work. What this third lien has done has completely blocked me from selling a house because I can't sell a house $150,000 house for one hundred and sixty. Not the Nobody in the right mind would do that. All right. So lean, in essence, reduce the right of disposition of the property owner because it now increases the amount that you owe against that property. The lender or court case or any situation like that establishes the right to be paid first or second or third depending on what position they're in when you sell the property all right so the second gets paid after the first lien the third gets paid after the second lien and in this example over here there's not even enough money to pay the third so you couldn't clear off i.e pay off all of the liens with the sale of the property. That is a problem. So liens are not ownership. They are an interest in the property and they could be future ownership if you fail to make your payments. All right. So here's the question again, one more time. What would the value be of a hundred thousand dollar house if we're two hundred thousand dollars worth of liens on it? Well, technically, the answer is nothing because you can't sell the property. 
you can't clear off all of the liens that are on the property. So liens in general merely reduce the ability of the homeowner to sell the property. Now, you know, the funny thing is with automobiles, we laugh about this. And in car industry and in the automobile industry, what do we always say? I'm upside down. I bought a brand new car, drove it off the lot. It's worth half of what it was. I'm already upside down. Same thing here, dude. You're upside down. You owe 160 on a house that's only worth 150. Your house is now underwater. Same issue, but we laugh about it in cars, seems like. So what is the title insurance underwriters policy? So the title insurance or the underwriter is the one responsible for reviewing and listing anything found in the chain of title that would be an exception to the policy. These are called the exclusions. So one more time, the chain of title, new word, a chain of title is nothing more but the ownership history of the property. Bill sold it to Sue, sold it to Mary, sold it to Bob, sold it to Kevin, and now Kevin wants to put it on the market for sale. All right. That chain goes all the way back to the root, which would be the very first person. You know, this is Bob, let's say. Bob had the house built. That would be the root. And this is the chain of title. In this particular case, this is what they call an unbroken chain. Because there's a very clean trace. You can see the history going back. So that is an unbroken chain of title. The underwriter is the one that will go into the public records and search that property address or legal description and find the chain of title. That is what they're going to do. And in that search, they hope to find an unbroken chain. Dude, that's the easy. That's like the lay down hand in Euchre, if you play Euchre, uh, where you go, here it is. All right. Now, they could find things like easements, encroachments. They could find other government related issues. They could find court cases. They could find all kinds of other things that might impact the current owner's enjoyment of the property. So they work with the title company or the title insurer, and they are the ones responsible for checking the title to make sure that the ownership rights of this land are not in question. All right. That usually entails a search of the chain of title, which is what we just talked about, so that they could present to the current owner any potential issues or hopefully no potential issues that they find. There are some common issues that underwriters find all the time. They may find a legal description issue. Maybe, you know, years ago, there was two parcels side by side. You know, here you've got two parcels. And a fence was put up because they thought that was the dividing line. And the reality is the property line was here. Well, this guy just started using, which was technically someone else's property, or this guy started using like that. There could be a legal description issue that changes. There could be judgments in court cases that got attached to the property. Maybe there was a lawsuit, someone filed, and the current owner of the house uh, was now involved in a lawsuit. Uh, they will actually run lawsuits against current owners. When the owner uh, sells his house and the realtor calls you and wants title work to be run, they will do a court search of the current owner to make sure that there are no outstanding court cases against that current owner that might show up. The other defects, omitted errors, I'm telling you that's a very common one of the problems you see. Unreleased marital rights. 
here in Indiana, <coughs> we're going to talk about this, but husbands and wives have the right to the property. You can't have one or the other sign and say, well, I'm selling the house. Uh, don't worry, my wife's okay with it. No, they own half of the property. They have got to sign away their marital rights. What I mean by that is both husband and wife would sign the listing agreement and both husband and wife would sign the deed uh, to show that, yes, we agree that we are going to sell uh, the property. There could be minor children involved that have rights, but because they're under the age of 18, they really can't file a lawsuit, so they have to have someone look out for them. There also could be uh, deeds that were defective prior to you owning it. And I told you, we saw one of those about, it was only about four or five years later, but the property had transferred hands two or three times. So there was a huge issue that happened with that. So the term that you see there in bold is clear because the seller wants to give clear title to the buyer and the lender wants clear title. Clear means all of the issues have been resolved and that there is no outstanding potential questions going on about the ownership and things like that. Now, that underwriter is going to search public records. They are going to search for deeds and marriage certificates and divorce decrees and wills and all kinds of things like that. They could draw on other sources too, like court documents, uh, taxing authorities, things of that nature that this underwriter is going to search. All right. So let's talk about escrow. Remember, if you've got any questions, feel free to email me at Raymond at realuniversity.com and uh, I'll try and answer anything I've got. So what is escrow and how does it work? Well, unfortunately, in the real estate world, the word escrow has several different meanings depending on who you're talking to and in what case are you using it. Basically, the word escrow boils down to the house and the money being in kind of a limbo. And what I mean by that is that money that is being held can go one direction if something happens or it could go another direction if something else happens depending on which one we're talking about and you'll see that here in just a minute but basically escrow is something that happens to the money based upon the outcome of whatever situation you're in so for an example the word escrow when dealing with realtors and in the real estate world is another word for earnest money. When the buyer makes an offer to the seller, they are going to offer a price, 400000 And with that, they are going to give an earnest money check of 1000 bucks or 4000 or whatever number. And that will be placed in escrow or held in escrow, typically by the listing broker, until the buyer and seller can close the deal. Then that earnest money is given as a credit to the buyer at the closing table. But you will hear managing brokers in the real estate world saying, well, you know, I'm holding $5,000 of escrow. They mean earnest money. They mean money that they are physically holding that will be a credit to the buyer at the closing table. That is typically what the real estate world uses that. So if you're talking to a realtor and they say, well, I've got 5,000 in escrow, you need to understand that that means they're holding it as earnest money to the deal. If the deal closes, it will go as a credit to the buyer. If the deal cannot close and there was a legal reason why the buyer couldn't buy, that money may go back to the buyer. And once again, that's what I mean by limbo. Depending on the outcome, that money could go in one direction 
or could go in the other direction. All right. Now, lenders, when they're using the word uh, escrow, they typically kind of mean the same thing. They are going to hold money in escrow, and sometimes you hear them use the word impound or reserve accounts. These terms they use interchangeably, but they all mean the same thing. These are typically money that is held by the lender to make payments on the homeowner's insurance and property taxes. Let's go over here and look at this thing here. You guys have may have heard this before, this term called the pity payment. Pity payment stands for principal interest taxes and insurance. Taxes mean the real estate taxes and insurance means homeowner's insurance, not the title insurance, that's separate. I know that's what this class is dealing with, but right now in this particular scenario, it is homeowner's insurance. So when some homeowner says, dude, my house payment, I'm using finger quotes and you can't say that, see that, is 900 a month, but my payments are escrowed. Or you might hear them say, I'm making a $900 pity payment. Well, and I'm just going to make up numbers here for an example. That might mean that $750 goes to the principal and the interest and this other 150 is broken out to $100 in the taxes and $50 to the insurance. So that when tax time rolls around and that person's taxes come due and all of a sudden they owe $1,200 in taxes, that homeowner goes, dude, I didn't get paid today. I don't have $1,200. The bank is going to go, don't worry. We have escrowed $100 a month for the last 12 months. We will go out and pay that for you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Oh, you know what? My home insurance is due. It's $600. I don't have that either. The bank's going to go, don't worry. For the last 12 months, we have been collecting $50 a month in your pity payment, so we will go out and pay that for you as well. That is called escrow. So when a lender says that the borrower's funds are going to be escrowed, they mean kind of the same thing. They are going to take a portion of that money and put it into an escrow or an impound or a reserve account for the new homeowner so that they can pay the last T and I for that homeowner. So that is the lender's version of the word escrow, okay? Lenders will collect them monthly along with the loan payment and pay the taxes and the insurance bill when they're due. And that's because that lender has a lien, remember, which is a future vested interest in making sure those payments are made. That lender certainly does not want the home to go to a tax sale because the homeowner didn't pay his taxes. That lender certainly does not want the house to burn down with no insurance on it because then they have no collateral for their loan. So in order to protect that, they escrow the homeowner's payments every month and then they will pay them to guarantee, yeah, we paid the, their taxes so we know they're paid. Yeah, we paid the insurance policy so we know that the house isn't uninsured. So that's what the bank is going to use the word escrow. <clears throat> and a lot of times, like I said, we've said this, you'll hear a homeowner say, hey, my house payments are escrowed, or I've got a pity payment of 900 bucks. And a lot of times you hear them say, yeah, my, oh, my monthly house payment's 1700. Well, actually your principal and interest is only 1400. The other money is going into escrow accounts for your taxes and your insurance. 
Now, sometimes closing people like your sales reps and the title insurance companies use the word escrow to mean another type of thing. Sometimes they hear it called closing in escrow. That is when they close the purchase and it's completed and they have a closing officer or the escrow officer will actually see all of the paperwork that it gets done and signed and all of that. Sometimes this person is an attorney or the title company employee that is hired to do the closing. They will ensure that all the money gets properly recorded, dispersed, all the documents are signed correctly and recorded, and all of this stuff. This is called a closing or the settlement. So the word escrow can mean several different things to different people you need to understand who you're talking to and what exactly is going on so that you know is it the real estate holding earnest money is it the lender with their impound accounts is it the closing person actually doing the closing whatever it is you need to understand all right any questions if there are please email me at raymond at realuniversity.com or check with the help button right above up there. There is a help button that will come directly to either our customer service support or myself, and we can answer any questions for you. All right, so what I want you to do now, stand up, take a break, walk around, get some more coffee, do whatever you need to do. We are going to come back with the next section, and we're going to deal with RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act. Okay, we'll be right back.